Good evening. Come on, if you guys want, come on up. We got lots of room and you can crowd in in the front. Better viewing up front. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight for this inaugural event for Shift Speaks, the summer long speaker series that we're using to establish the foundation for the Shift Festival in October. My name is Christian Beckwith. I'm the director of the, of Shift, and it's my honor to debut it with you here tonight. We are live streaming tonight's talk on Facebook, so please join me in welcoming our online viewers. And for their sakes and for the sakes of, sakes of others here in the room tonight, please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already. I'd like to thank the National Museum of Wildlife Art, Pitch Engine, and the Murray Center all of whom are helping us to develop SHIFT. I'd also like to thank the Reverend Mary Erickson of St. John's for making the chapel available to us tonight. And we are particularly grateful to Meg Daly, <laughs> our coordinator for the SHIFT Speak Speaker Series, who she has put tonight's event together and she is hard at work on the next three events, which we'll be holding over the course of the next few months in the lead up to the SHIFT Festival in October. The former Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans, International Environment, and Scientific Affairs, John Turner, will be speaking in the middle of next month. Entrepreneur and conservationist Story Clark will be speaking at the end of August. And on September 16th, Reverend Mary Erickson. So we're looking forward to all three of those. And Meg, thank you very much for all your diligence. So big question, what is SHIFT? The easy answer is that SHIFT is an annual conservation event that was commissioned earlier this year by the Jackson Hole Travel and Tourism Board as part of their mission to develop Jackson's year-round economy. Their mandate was to create an event with a triple bottom line to increase tourism in October while also bringing value to our community and to the environment. But to properly answer the question of what SHIFT is, it became necessary to first determine what SHIFT should be and that, in turn, depended in part on who we are as a community. It's tough to live here, maybe not right now in the middle of the summer, but it always has been tough, particularly in winter. But the winters are so long. The growing seasons are short. The elevation is high. The weather is harsh. And our isolation makes it difficult to escape. Like the flora and fauna that inhabit this valley, the people who live here, you, are tenacious. Few of us move here for a job, fewer still stay for professional advantage. As a result, our community is both resourceful and deliberate. We're relatively rich and correspondingly philanthropic. We have great schools and great arts and amenity, amenities befitting communities much larger than our own. Best of all, we have a fantastic backyard that includes two national parks, seven national protected areas, five lakes, three rivers, as you well know, it's absolutely spectacular here. And it's why most of us choose to live here. On many levels, we lead lives like all Americans, working and producing and consuming week after week, year after year, building out livelihoods that support our families and our lifestyles. But our commutes are special. On the way to work, we see the Tetons gracing the skyline with snow-covered tops. Snow King, seated in the lotus position, cradles our town in its lap. Sleeping Indian presides over our eastern perimeter in beneficent recline. Jackson Hole is a microcosm of the world, and we are society's children living by its norms. But there are other cues to guide us, and we live closer to them than most. On days off, we hunt in the Grovant, climb roots in the Tetons, fish the snake, watch the buffalo on Antelope Flats, when spring comes, we abide the hail and sleet and rain of May, knowing they'll hold the September wildfires at bay. We chart the recession of snow from the high peaks from year to year, looking for patterns. We gossip about the breeding habits of favorite grizzlies with familial pride. Like many of you, my wife and I are raising a family here. On picnics in Curtis Canyon, I watch my daughter run below the ghost forest on Jackson Peak, and I wonder, what can I do? When the white bark pines die, the shade they provide disappears. The winter snow beneath them melts more quickly. Premature runoff 
raises the te river's temperatures. The trout suffer, the fishermen suffer, so do the guide services. You can call it climate change if you'd like, but it doesn't change that fundamental question that I keep asking myself. What can I do? What kind of world am I gonna give my daughter? Like most of you, my family, we live here for this environment, among this environment, upon this environment. The health of our forests and our rivers affects the vitality of our families and our economy. For all of us, it's personal and it's connected. As isolated as this valley may feel, during a December blizzard, even our mountains are not high enough to shelter us from China's pollution and India's population. Around the world, local actions lead increasingly to global problems or, if managed correctly, to global solutions. In order for it to succeed, shift must be focused on these solutions. And it must also be an authentic ex expression of Jackson Hole, whose economic vitality and environmental quality are inextricably linked. As a crucible of conservation, Jackson has long been devoted to a stewardship of the lands we inhabit. Aldo Leopold defined conservation as a state of harmony between men and land. Living in such a powerful place, we become inclined to preserve this harmony because we see so clearly what happens when it is upset. And that, in turn, is the opportunity that SHIFT represents, to develop solutions that preserve the balance we see all around us every day. Though SHIFT began just a few months ago, we're already working with local organizations from the Teton Science School to the Murray Center to Slow Foods of the Tetons on local actions that, become, that can become global solutions. And we invite you to join us. We're privileged to live in Jackson Hole. And with that privilege comes responsibility. If we manage it correctly, with your help, SHIFT will become our answer, our answer to that responsibility. SHIFT Speaks is helping us to develop our foundation for the October event by aligning provocative speakers with unexpected venues. We're trying to come at conservation from fresh angles. There's perhaps no better person to help us do this than our first speaker. A proud product, South Central LA. Juan Martinez is a National Geographic emerging, emerging Explorer and the director of the Natural Leaders Network of the Children and Nature Network. His passion to empower individuals, particularly young ones, led him to direct the Sierra Club's first Environmental Justice Youth Leadership Academy in Los Angeles. An ambassador with the North Face, Juan addresses nature deficit disorders in today's youth, all part of his commitment to building healthier communities throughout our country. Though Juan moved to Jackson rather recently, his connection to the community runs deep. As a high school student, he received a two-week scholarship to the Teton Science Schools that changed his life. He climbed the Grand with Conrad Anchor in 2009, and in 2011, he served as the explorer in residence at the Murray Center. And he's now embarking on the expedition of his life as he's engaged to Grand Teton National Park Ranger, Vanessa Torres. Please join me in welcoming Juan Martinez. So thank you guys for uh, coming out tonight and being a part of this. Um, I, uh, I want to... Uh, start off with that with that sense of gratitude uh, for you guys taking the time out of your your life to come out here and be a part of shift uh, to Mary thank you so much many times I've gone to browse and buy uh, but never had I been in this beautiful building over a hundred years old about a hundred years old as I just learned today um, so really special and I think that's that's the uh, the unique aspect that shift is really going to bring to the community uh, as we embark on, on this journey together, that when Christian first approached me about coming out and speaking on this, he was really gung-ho about conservation and, and uh, how we were going to build a, a better tomorrow for our children. And my response to him was really it had to be a community-focused effort. And by opening the doors of, of St. John's Chapel and, and opening the doors of Shift to the world through the online stream, I think it's, it's very unique in that aspect that, that shift has the unique opportunity to do that. 
uh, through all our different initiatives. So I have a presentation. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about my story and how I came to be, um, how, I, how I'm standing before you guys today. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about what I think is the opportunity that Jackson Hole has unique to itself as, as a community. And then we'll talk about some, some solutions that I've implemented across the country that I think could help and we can learn from together. Uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. And uh, really, I want to have a conversation because that's what I really believe in is, is a community conversation and making this work. So. so I grew up in South Central in the shadow of the LA riots. I didn't think about the future much. By the age of 15, I stared down the barrel of a gun two times. In order to get out of the tension, I had to join Eco Club. And that turned out to be the best decision of my life. I came home a different person. And now, I'm a bridge between nature and the streets. I'm just trying to teach kids that it's cool to play in the dirt. I'm Juan Martinez. And I love nature like I love my hood. And now I'm a National Geographic Explorer. And uh, what you see there is, is a car on fire. Um, for many people, it might seem like a faraway place in a faraway land. Those are the 1992 riots in LA. Uh, if many of you recall that, that part of history, for me, it was as real as life ever approached itself. I was six years old at the time. <clears throat> and for me, growing up and, and Growing up as, a, as an Im immigrant kid, being, being called a spick, being called a wetback, being told to go back to my country, um, I was already pretty angry at the world. I, was, I felt like somehow life had dealt me the wrong cards. Um, and, and that's uh, right across the street from, from my uh, my apartment building at the time, all those buildings and markets are burnt to the ground. Um, I watched military tanks go down, walk, uh, drive down my street. Uh, I, I slept in, in a bathtub uh, for three nights because my parents were afraid that bullets would go through the windows and hit us while we were sleeping. And somehow, I, I really got this pent up anger inside of me. And I realized that at the core of everything that I do, in retrospect, I did it for my family. And I wanted to protect my family so much that I would consider whatever way I could to make a dollar. And for me, the most immediate pathway to that was becoming a gang member. Uh, because for me, it wasn't so much about the glorified lifestyle of a gang member. It was more about how they could put food on the table, protect their family, and at the end of the day, pay rent. And there, wasn't, there, there weren't enough opportunities for me in front of me that I could see otherwise. But it wasn't always bad. That's a picture of my dad and my niece in our backyard garden uh, that my mom broke through concrete to, to put her plants. And she grew everything from beans, aloe vera, chamomile, all these different things that I didn't realize what she was doing, but she was, in, in her own way, she was passing on her culture. And so at the age of 15, I found myself at a, at a, at a milestone. Um, my, I ended up in detention. Uh, and in detention, they gave me an ultimatum. They said, either you stay in detention or you go to this thing called Eco Club. And when I was at Eco Club, I, I wasn't quick to jump on the opportunity to become a part of Eco Club because from my perspective, Eco Club was this thing where the geeks and the dorks hung out. Uh, it, was, it was a place where I, didn't, I, didn't, I couldn't see myself fitting in. But I showed up the first day and the first, so I decided to take a chance and went. And the first day they just, my teacher, Ms. Glenda Pepin, just gave me a box of seeds. And she said, pick a bag and let's go out to the garden. And in that garden, 
what I decided to plant were jalapenos. Because I remembered my mom's garden. And I wanted to show my mom, because I thought I was so messed up at that time, I wanted to show my mom that I could do something right, that I could do one thing right. And so I decided to grow these jalapenos. And as I started to grow these jalapenos, I started to read up on pH balance and soil erosion. And then it hit me. They had tricked me. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't care. I wanted to make the best salsa for my mom. Um, and so it kept coming day after day. And, and somewhere along the line, Ms. Ms. Glenda Pepin saw an opportunity, saw an opportunity in, within me and saw she offered me to apply for a scholarship to the Teton Science School. Schools now. Uh, back then, it was only one school. Uh, Thirteen years ago, and uh, I came. That's no, fine. Um, and I and I came, and when, and I got the scholarship. And for me to get a scholarship at the age of fifteen within my community, it was a pretty big deal. the The way I sold this opportunity to my parents was that it was a scholarship to further my education. It wasn't about the experience. It wasn't about going off to, to a far place or that I was going to have fun. For, for me to sell to my parents that I was going to go away from home for two weeks, which was something that I had never done, that we would never do, um, she, the way that, that, that my parents saw that was an opportunity for me to further my education. So they, they, they supported me in that effort. And I remember. Flying, first off, getting, getting on a plane for the first time in my life, coming into Salt Lake City. I mean, if you've ever taken that trip, you know what it's like. We took a bus that broke down two times on its way up here. Um, and, then, and then we got here at night, so I couldn't really see as we were driving through town the, what, what we all know to be true. But I remember getting off that bus, and for the first time, air piercing my lungs, turning up to the sky, and for the first time in my life, seeing more stars than I could count, going to sleep without a siren or a helicopter over my head, going to sleep in my own bed, which I, back, at, back home, my sisters took the bed, and I would take the, 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 the floor. And Next morning, I wake up, and, and these things are staring at me. <laughs> and somehow, within all that, I found enough of my heart and soul in both in, in these mountains and back in South Central LA with my family to figure out that there was some kind of connection, to finally figure out that I made sense, that I had value to this universe, that my life was significant. And I decided that this was going to be my effort to build a bridge between those two universes that, that seem so different but yet so parallel at the same time. Uh, because what I realized was that it's, it's out there where the trees don't, don't really look at your skin color. They're still going to quake and you're going to be able to Learn about all, all the different flora and fauna out there. The river doesn't see your income level. You can still go drink from it and, and, and play. And the mosquitoes really don't care <laughs> who you are. They're still going to do their thing. So. So the new age of exploration, I think, is something that I'm here to talk about. And one of the reasons why I believe uh, National Geographic chose me as, as an explorer for, for, to join the ranks of, of Jane Goodall, Bob Ballard, um, the Crackheads, the Crackhead brothers that, that reside here in Jackson. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but there, yeah. <laughs> In 1888, a club was formed with a mission to explore. Today, that
that spirit lives on in a new generation of National Geographic Explorers. Innovative thinkers who redefine exploration. Living the mission and making the world a better place. So what I've, what I've realized in my conversations with National Geographic and, and why they ended up choosing me as, as one, of, one of the explorers was that it's a 150-year-old organization. They just celebrated their 150 years old. And there's, there's a great sense of exploration that we're, we, we, are, we are getting to the highest peaks and we're go, getting to the bottom of the seafloor and we're going as far as we ever imagined into, into the outer universe. But the conversation really lies in how do we translate everything that we're doing to make meaningful community impact. So a snapshot of, of the issue that I work on is uh, related around what Richard Louvre, author of The Last Child, of the Woods, Last Child in the Woods, uh, coined a phrase called nature deficit disorder. And it's the theory that as generations go on, the connection with the natural world grows wide. And when that connection grows wider and wider, there are more health, emotional, psychological, um, challenges that are faced with that society. And he, he will be the first person to say that that is not a medical term in any way, sense, or shape, or form, but it's, a, it's more of a term he used to describe society in, in this aspect. Uh, the Surgeon General has given us the first warning to our generation, the millennial generation, that if we don't curb our habits of, the way, of our lifestyle, uh, we are on the pathway to be the first generation to successfully reduce lifetime expectancy. Um, so there's over 7 billion people on Earth as of this moment. And those seven, out of those 7 billion people, over 50% of those uh, people now live in an, within 10 miles of an urban center. But here's, here's an interesting fact that, that I found out, that if you, were to put those seven bill, if you were to put seven billion people shoulder to shoulder with each other, they could all fit within the city of LA. So it's not necessarily a, 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 a conversation around whether we're running out of natural resources. It's whether, how we're managing those natural resources and how we're developing renewable energy and technology to keep the resources that we do have intact going. A quick snapshot of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, a lot of the things that I would said previously probably don't apply to Jackson Hole. Uh, and I think that's where, where the uh, opportunity really lies. There are over, a little over 9,000 um, people that live in the town of Jackson year round. Out of that, 9,000, 25%, over 25% of those are Latino. Um, I know that shocked me too when I heard it. Maybe not you guys because you've been living here. But our unemployment rate is about 2%, one, one of the lowest unemployment rates in the United States. Uh, there's over 200 nonprofits based out of Jackson and over three million visitors come through our town every year. So I think that's where the opportunity really lies. And, and we have an amazing uh, array of, of organizations that are already working on this, from the Murray Center, the legacy of the Murrays who helped establish the Arch National Wildlife Refuge. And I've been working with them to, to uh, to develop that conversation of conservation. Um, the Teton Science Schools in their, in their uh, first class programs within the United States, they're setting the, they're setting the bar for, for the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Um, to our public land agencies that are working with programs like Teton 10, 
<clears throat> uh, the white young stewards and leaders of, that's run out of the National Park Service, um, the Children's Forest that's close to here. And there's art, music, everything you can imagine that, that, that this small town really holds. So my challenge is really built around this idea that what if the 9,000 people really developed a significant relationship with their natural environment? The what if that if we all committed within that all these different initiatives and campaigns that are working together to really put a concerted effort and establish some, some metrics and goals. And that's, I think, the, the, the beauty about Shift Jackson Hole, that it's not necessarily trying to be a campaign or an initiative. It's trying to be, well, what I think is, is and, and Christian and I have talked about this, is to celebrate that synergy that's happening there, to celebrate the conversation that's happening there, and to invite the world to come and help us build it. So <clears throat> why I do it, I establish uh, Rich Louvre and I have worked closely together. I run his youth leadership development program throughout the country and, and worldwide. And what the Children in Nature Network has established, so out of his book, out of writing his book, he co-founded the Children in Nature Network. And the Children in Nature Network is really a collaborative of networks and individuals and organizations that say we want to step a little bit away from sounding the bell of climate change, global carbon, if we don't hit 350 parts per million of, of our carbon monoxide uh, uh, spill that, that we're, we're headed towards a, uh, a dark day. What, we really, what Children in Nature Network, I think, really focuses on is something that, that Rich has said, put very well in a point is, Dr. King didn't say he had a nightmare. <laughs> Dr. King said he had a dream. And we really see our role in trying to bring this conversation to build what that dream looks like, to build what that tangible thing people can feel and look towards to. Because I've gone across the country and I've talked to kids as young as eight and as old as 55. And what everybody keeps on bringing up is, is this dire sense of defeat, that we are headed towards a dark age. What, what I really want to bring is celebrate that, that message of our connection with the natural world that I don't think is done often enough or enough of to really do that. Because I, I believe that if you make that connection, the rest of it just kind of flows out of it, whether that's through hunting and fishing, ATVs, whether it's camping, backpacking, or rock climbing, whatever that form of connecting with the outdoors is, I think it's, it's a powerful message to be put out there. So with the Natural Leaders Network, the Youth Leadership Development Program of the Children in Nature Network, we've established young leaders throughout the United States. With the Children in Nature Network, we, have a, we touch over 3 million kids under the age of 18 every year, not only in all 50 states of the United States, but in three different countries. We are the uh, leading organization in, in putting out research and news that comes out of, out of the, uh, the issue. So I am not a scientist by trade, but I will point you to that website where all the scientists live. Um, um, and I do it for adventure. You can't have, you can't do it without fun. In um, uh, 2009, uh, the North Face asked me to, to, to come out and be a a guest speaker for them at the Outdoor Retailer Show. In that show, I was looking at this picture. Before the show, I was looking at this picture of, of uh, the Grand Teton. And at that point, I, I still was not living here. And from behind me comes this tall, slanky guy. And we start just 
talking about the, the Teton and what it meant to him and his friends and his family. And I started talking about the Teton and what it meant to me, very similar to how I told my story earlier. And I, out, of, out of the tip of my tongue, I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to climb that mountain one day. And he looks over at me and says, <clears throat> I'm going in three weeks. You want to go? <laughs> and uh, there's always a thousand excuses you can say to not do something. And, and I was trying to come up with some of them. And he didn't have any of that. So we, uh, we go over to Steve Randall. He pulls me by, by, the, by the sleeve. And, and we walk over to Steve Randall, who was the president of the North Face at the time. And I knew who Steve was, but I still didn't know who this guy was. Um, and he tells Steve, hey, I want to go climb the Grand Teton with Juan. Do you think you can help him out with some gear and a ticket? And this is the president of a multi-million dollar company. So he says, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and so I'm trying to figure out what, who this guy is. And they were showing a, a, a trailer for a movie. And they were showing the movie at that, at that time in a theater. And it was called the, uh, oh, man. I'm blanking. The, uh, the Greatest Dream. Um, the Greatest Dream. And, uh, and it's a story about how there's a debate about who climbed Everest for the first time and um, whether it was Shallard or somebody else. Um, and it was a story about this guy who went up and found the body and, and solved the mystery about Everest and who climbed Everest. And as they're describing the movie, and we're all sitting down, they ask uh, Conrad Anchor to stand up. And it happens to be this guy who I just agreed to go with <laughs> in three weeks to climb the Teton. So it really, I think what that story really says is, you know, in, in August 9th of 2000, no, September 9th, 2009, we summited the grant with Conrad Anker, one of the living legends of, of alpine uh, climbing in the world. He was just rated by ESPN, I think, like one of the top seven athletes in the world. All that aside, it was that conversation of us and just how much this mountain meant to us back home and wherever we lived that, that brought that together. Uh, so I do it for adventure. I do it to empower other individuals. And I think at the end of the day, the, the reason why I was doing a lot of the bad stuff uh, back in my early days was my family. And a lot of the reason why I keep doing a lot of the good stuff I do today is my family. And that's my family um, during the National Geographic uh, shoot, um, which you saw a couple of clips of today. And my only condition to, to, to the crew when they came out was that they had <clears throat> they had to go to the, to the garden, and they had to go have a meal with my family. Um, and, and I can't tell you how much that meant to me to, for my mom to, to have National Geographic filming her garden. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty rocking. And it was one of those few things you can do as a son to, to repay something. Uh, and in September, I'll be. Uh, taking my vows with my lovely fiance um, here in the Grand Tetons. And um, what I've come to realize about family is that it goes beyond those who I really hold close to my heart. It's, uh, it's going to be my future wife, and it's going to be my mom and dad and, and my sisters forever. But if I'm going to be successful at pouring my heart and soul into, into a movement, into a passion, I have to consider every single one of you here that wants to join that cause part of my family. And it's, it's not an easy thing to do, especially when you grow up in a community where you're pushed against that. Uh, and so I'll end it with, with a quote from a Majora Carter, who's one of my uh, role models and, and friends. We might have come here from very different 
uh, very, very different stations in life. But believe me, we all share one incredible, incredible, powerful thing. We have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Thank you. Yeah. So for those of you who can stay, we're going to have questions from the audience. And um, as you can tell, our mics don't actually amplify the sound in here, but it'll be for uh, our live stream. So does anybody have a question or something they want to say to Juan? Conversation to start. So if you can hold this sort of close to your mic. I'm wondering who sponsored your scholarship up here. I, I know who it is. Uh, it was Mike Hoover uh, of, of the Hoover family. And he was married to Beverly Johnson at the time. And they live out of Kelly. Um, and Beverly Johnson and, and Mike are world-renowned cinematographers and adventure filmmakers. And Beverly and, and Mike were down in, in the LA riots. Um, uh, and they were filming kits. Uh, they were just filming everything that was going on, and, and they ran into a couple of kits from, from South Central, and they asked them, had they ever been outside of South Central or to anywhere like the Grand Tetons? Uh, and obviously, that, the, the answer was no. And uh, Beverly had always wanted to really establish something on, on, uh, to get kids on, on a scholarship basis. But before she did that, she could do that. She passed away in a helicopter heli skiing accident. Um, and so Mike went on and established the scholarship on, on her behalf, and uh, that, that's, that's how I ended up coming up here, uh, through, through Mike and the Teton Science School's efforts to, to put that scholarship program together. Anyone else? How do you define nature deficit disorder, and how do you address it? So I, I define nature deficit disorder as, as the lack of a connection with the natural world uh, on a constant basis. And for me, it's, it's a very different issue than just having a one-time experience. And I think the conversation really, the conversation now in general around the conservation movement is revolving around this. There's so many good organizations out there that take kids outside and will give them a one-time, once-in-a-lifetime experience. But I think the real benefit and the uh, cultivation of that relationship is the key to address curbing nature deficit disorder. So it goes long beyond just having that one-time experience in, in the park or, or having that one hiking experience or going fishing that one time uh, to really developing what that means in their own community in their own life and, and building advocates within the community to speak about those experiences. And I think one of the perfect examples is, is the Young Stewards and Leaders program that actually takes the kids outside, but not only does that, it builds a curriculum, it builds a mentorship uh, sustainable program and, and um, goes beyond just that one-time experience. And we, we need more, more of that. Yeah. Oh, hold on. You want to get your voice on the mic? Hey, thanks so much for sharing your story. Uh, I'm curious. We're, at least most of us, very privileged to live here. Really happy you're living here. What do you think all of us in this room should be doing? What's our responsibility? What can we do to make a difference on all of this stuff? Yeah, I think the... Uh the responsibility can only go so far as, as the responsibility that you want to take on. Um, and for each one of us, it's going to be different. For, for me, it happens to be this connection, connecting with the, with the outdoors. But I think if I can ask you to do one thing, if you, you can take away one thing from, from this conversation, is to really look at yourself as a mentor to another young person. Because there was nothing as powerful as an opportunity. And for me, an opportunity came through, through that eco club and having that scholarship. But for you, if it's through accounting, if it's through pilot training, if it's through scuba diving, uh, if it's through medical uh, internships or, or whatever it is that you can see yourself providing as, as, as and really playing the role of a mentor uh, and going beyond just the specific boundaries that, you're set, that, that are set upon yourself that you can only talk about um, certain things. For me, 
my mentors went beyond just asking me how I felt when I went outside to, to, the, to the outdoors. They asked me about my family. And they asked me about what my life goals were. Um, and so those are the kind of mentors that, that I think we, we need more of. Um, so if you can see yourself as one of those, please don't hesitate to step up to the plate. And the, obviously there's just an, uh, an amount of over 200 org nonprofit organizations that are based out of, out of here. Everything from Sierra Club to MPCA to the, Nash the Grand Teton Foundation. Um, if you can get involved with one of those, please do so. And, and last, uh, but certainly not least, is, is uh, coming out and, and supporting and showing, and showing the Chamber of Commerce that things like Shift Jackson Hole can happen more and more of, um, so that we can, in October, when we start to launch this thing, it can really bring the conversation to, to, a, to a catalyst. Thank you for that question. Hi, um, I just had a question about your efforts in um, South Central LA. And I just wondered what your connections are there with the schools and um, is it kids of all ages or are you starting with just like little, little guys and bringing them uh, close to nature or is there any of that kind of activity going on? Yeah, so I mean I can name off a bunch of different organizations that work with them and primarily what I do is I work with the rising young leaders that need those mentors and need those that leadership and professional development from everything from how to stand in public and tell your personal story to writing grants and getting funding for your organization. So I, I primarily deal with that professional development uh, and I look at uh, young leaders between the ages of 18 to 29. However, what, I, what we found between that bracket is that if that's kind of the sweet spot because they're working with younger kids and they're also uh, starting off as young professionals to really establish themselves and their, and their, uh, their skill set to affect uh, at the higher level. And uh, I mean, we have young leaders that do everything from urban gardening to being school teachers. Um, Carson High School was just up here at the Murray Center this past week as, as part of the Murray Kids program. Um, there's an, uh, a crew from Summer Search and Teton Science Schools that's here that, that we've been working, I've been working with and talking with. And uh, I think I, for me, it's more about that professional development and, and having some, some young rising star know that they fit in somewhere and have a, a source of uh, resources and, and network and support. Other folks, Paul? <laughs> I'm trying to build it on Trevor's question. You pointed out that we have 3 million visitors in a county of 18,000 people. Are we doing enough to lead by our example? People are coming here open to a message on nature, a message on wildlife. Are we doing enough to send them home with a conservation message by our example? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too hard on ourselves, and, and you know, I'm, I'm starting to consider myself a part of this community. Um, uh, I wouldn't be too hard. It's three million people. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of people. Um, but I think that there is already some great initiatives on board that need the support of, of the community to keep going forward, that need the funding support, not only from the local community, but also at the national scope. I really believe that, that within this community, there's 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 a nugget of a of a of a gold golden nugget in there that that uh, there's a program in there that really combines all of these different uh, partnerships everything from an NPS academy that that encourages diverse uh, uh, students from different backgrounds to come in and, and consider career paths within the National Park Service to um, going out and fly fishing and learning how to fly fish. There's, there's a formula in there with all these different variables that are, that are playing their part, but I think the, the, the formula is, is something that, that I'm really excited about figuring out. And, and what, I, what I really see the opportunity for shift, again, Jackson Hole, is, is to figure out that formula of, of, for a national, for a national um, 
example of how this can work because we have it all here. We have we have the impact, we have the resources, we have the amazing passion of individual community members to the passion of organizations. There's something here that we can really establish and, and lead the way in. Thank you for that question. What have you found that has worked? Getting kids outside and interested and engaged? <clears throat> Getting kids outside and, and engaged is, is kind of an easy part. That's, that's the easy part. Um, getting them excited and getting them to be kids and play in the mud and, and do those kind of things is, is, I really believe, the easy part. And there's great examples of great organizations that are doing that out there. But I think it's, it's time for us to go beyond that, that conversation of, of we're getting kids outside and, and that's great. But, and for a long time, I, I, I'm guilty of this too. We're getting kids outside and that's great. What I see the, the, the uh, challenge in it is, is really what happens when they go back home. How do we translate that experience when they go back home? Even here in Jackson Hole, how does that how does that uh, experience really affect how they interact with their school system, with their local park, with uh, their family? Um, so, so I haven't seen a, a, an example of that really working. There's so many other examples that, that go the route of education and, and uh, 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 sports. Uh, and things like that, but within the context of conservation is, is really one that I don't, I don't think has been really identified in. Um, and the, the, uh, the, con the conversation of conservation is evolving, and that's a mouthful, um, because conservation by, by nature dictates that we have to conserve and keep out. Um, and really that, that's, that's, that's only going to get us so far in terms of how a community is, feels empowered and ownership of a certain place when they can't be a part of that place. Um, and so we have to go beyond conservation and, and look at creating green space and beyond creating green space, creating a relationship with that green space. Anyone else? Okay. Um, hello, Indiana. How you doing? <laughs> hey, I'm one of the three million visitors come through here, and uh, your uh, commitment to uh, outside uh, conservation is loud and clear to coming from a person that comes from a uh, GM town of 20,000 jobs that are now gone. We have empty fields. Uh, but what I want to say is, you know, the hybrid parking, the bike hikes, uh, and I see them being used, occupied every day. You know, it's a beautiful thing. How do you change government perception? Because I come from a big city. I know, the, I know our mayor back in Indiana, and I like green space. I want to see raspberries. I want to see wildflowers. I want to see trees, native trees planted in, in uh, places where they just grow grass. H how do you approach the government, the local government, uh, to maybe consider something like this. And also, um, I go to church, we bought an old school, we pulled up the uh, blacktop, and we started planting gardens. Cool. And yeah. we're trying to get the children in the community engaged. And, you know, how, how can, you know, I, was, I wrote down in my journal, flowers bring in butterflies. And, you know, do you just start small and be persistent? Got any comments or thoughts on this? <clears throat> yeah, I think the, we need we need those those small victories and, and those stories of, of people going beyond just the limitations that government instills upon a certain uh, place. There's there's a, one one example is is the 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 uh, gorilla farms that are happening in, in South Central LA where people are throwing seed pods out of out of their cars or growing gardens within freeway, wasted away green space. Um, because there, there's only, I think at the same time, there's such a, a, a built-in system within government that, that there's only so much they can do with limited amount of resources. 
Uh, so when, when stories like yours of ripping off the top uh, come about, I think it, it's, it's a pretty clear message that this is what the people want. And the uh, Cesar Chavez once, once said, un derecho ejercido no es un derecho perdido. Un derecho no ejercido es un derecho perdido. And a right not exercised is a right lost. Um, and so when, when you really flex your muscle as a voting town and say, this, we want more green space, but not only say that and say, these are the amount of voters that are saying that, that are saying, these, these are how many registered voters we have with this coalition that want this change. Now will you sit down and, and speak with us about that? Those, sometimes it's, it's tough for, I think for, for government, we kind of have to nudge them a little bit and say, hey, this is the kind of stuff we need to get done. Um, hence why, why within the Children and Nature Network, we really, what I really focus on is, is really handing over grassroots uh, leadership skills to, to these young leaders so that not only are they saying, come on kids, let, and come on kids and communities, let's get outside, but once they go back to the community, say, OK, let's talk about the challenges. And let's talk about the solutions that you see here. Let's put them down on paper. And let's go to City Hall and say, this is our voice. I think that's a, yeah, and you're very different. Uh, you're within this small town context. I think it's, it's, it's very particular and very, very unique in itself. But coming from a big city and, and knowing what LA is like and knowing what Detroit, I'm guessing. No? Anderson, Indiana, OK. Anderson, Indiana is like, um, it's, it's those, those grassroots tactics seem to, to often work with the, with the political mindset. Hi, Juan. Congratulations Hi. on your engagement. Thank you. Are you familiar with the old fresh air program that took inner city youth into the countryside? Old fresh air? Yeah. No, it's called I'm the not. Fresh air program. That's something I was involved in as a child um, back in Pennsylvania, and we hosted kids from the inner city. And I was wondering what ever happened to that program. It's defunct to my knowledge, but it was long before Lou came on the scene and wrote the book and identified nature uh, deficit disorder. Yeah. I, that's what that program was getting at. I'm wondering if maybe that's worth examining and seeing what happened to that program, what the results were. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of great programs out there that are doing amazing work. And, and again, I'm, I'm guilty of this when, when I first started. I wasn't, I wasn't putting the metrics down. I wasn't saying, you know, not only are we getting these kids outside, you know, we can get 1,000 kids outside, but what does that mean? What is that tangible? What is, how many of those kids are graduating in high school? How many of those kids are, are increasing their math and science scores? And how many of those kids are off pharmaceuticals or on pharmaceuticals? And, and what, what, what does this connection with the natural world mean? And, and when you combine the qualitative with the quantitative, I think it's a, it's a, it's a powerful message. So uh, you know, it's, it saddens me when, it, when I hear that, that there's great organizations and projects that go on and, and, and don't make it. But it's, a, it's, it's and again, Jackson Hole is a very unique position. We, we have a very supportive community of all these initiatives. But the rest, rest of the country is, is very competitive to come up for these funds for nonprofits. And so I don't know, but it, it'd definitely be worth looking into. Um, so I think just to be respectful of people's time, um, we're going to take one more question, comment from Nancy. Um, I was very moved when you were describing going into nature and not feeling judged, uh, which have, of course is not the case in the human population. And I, it seems as though what I hear you saying is um, that you're sort of transcending what I've always seen as kind of a division between people who want to do good in the world. And they either work in social justice and try to you know, break down some of the things that you know, humans do that aren't so kind. Yeah. Or they work in environmental protection, environmental, you know, environmental causes. 
it seems like you're saying we need to break that barrier down. Yeah. That these things are very connected. And yeah. I'd love to hear how, how that works in you. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> man. That, that's, that's an awesome question. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I mean, my... So my story goes, I ended up, I've been, I've only been working on this issue full time for the last five years. So relatively new to me. For, for a long time, I was working uh, in a fair housing initiative program down in LA, which dealt with discrimination in housing issues and uh, fighting for, for families that were losing their homes to, due to foreclosures. Um, and uh, getting these communities together to advocate on specific laws and initiatives within the state of California. Uh, and that's really where, where, where I learned the power of, of empowering leaders. Um, and when I justify this to myself, why, why I do what I do uh, and I am so passionate about this is that really I'm an empowering I'm empowering leaders within communities. Um, that the skill set that they gain from going out and playing in the back country and, and going fishing and those memories that they will build there will make them better leaders. That by being a part of initiatives that look at social justice issues and fight for those issues will make them better leaders within their community. And that's really, I think, at, at, the, at the helm of what I do, I feel, um, an obligation to do uh, because people believed in me to be a leader and, and until I saw that within myself I didn't really believe that I could create change for a positive impact within my community. Um, so that, that, and you're very right, when I, when, I speak of, when I speak about this there is this barrier of, of social issues and I think we are, we need to go beyond that, that, that barrier and really talk about the underlying of, of everything that we need to do together. Um, that social justice issues uh, are, are very, very much a critical part of the conversation that, that we're having today and, and that uh, within the social justice realm, they, they see our issue as, as a critical part of the conversation as well. Um, so thank you for that, yeah. Maybe we can thank Juan. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Meg, for pulling us all together. Yeah, Meg. <laughs> so our next speaker will be uh, mid-August. Yes. And we're 90-ish percent sure it will be John Turner. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much for